For those of you who have just joined us for the first time today, this is the fourth part of our Surreal series with Kelly. Um, so if you have missed any of the previous episodes, then do head over to Learn Design Club on YouTube and you can watch all of the episodes, which I would highly recommend that you do because they were very informative, very interesting and very fun. Um, so ne no need for anyone to have missed out. Um, but today, Kelly will be taking us through rethinking fashion, wrapping everything up, um, and you know, giving us another insightful hour of her time. Um, so very excited for that. If anyone um, has any questions or hasn't heard of the RDC Accelerator before, I'm Amanda, I'm heading up this kind of area of Lone Design Club, which is a platform to unite and support independent brands. The LDC Accelerator is a course and series um, that provides brands with the necessary information to grow and scale as a successful business. Um, so do check us out on our website and give us a follow on Instagram at LDC Accelerator. Um, but enough about my boring stuff, we'll head on over to Kelly. <laughs> Hi everybody, um, thank you very much for attending over the past few weeks and thank you Amanda for the always amazing introduction. This is our final look at, um, I guess, innovating fashion through tech has been the title, but I guess we're innovating our fashion selves completely, um, rethinking what the design objects are that we want to create, whether they're garments or other styles of apparel or accessories, and how we present them to the audience. So let's kick off. If you're new to this series, I'm Kelly Vero. I've been working for 25 years in technology, mostly in games and apps. I now work for So Real, which is an organization based in Switzerland. We create what we, we call game ready, extended reality objects for use in fashion and a variety of other verticals. I'm also a fashion innovator, so I'm constantly thinking about ways that we can take vintage stuff like this wonderful Christa de Carouge jacket and make it relevant. And I also work as a technology mentor in my spare time with a variety of um, female and startup organizations. I'm just an all round thoroughly nice person. If you want to be in touch with me, you can do so at the end by asking questions or by contacting me through LinkedIn or directly through SoReal. So here's the objectives for today. We're going to be exploring technology in fashion weeks and seasonal events. We're going to understand the existing and transferable techniques and terminology in future fashion and I want us to provide discussion points for development and sustainability of design and manufacture that we can take back to our businesses, micro studios, organizations, etc., for further discussion. In May of 2020, I was fortunate enough to be involved in the Ethical Fashion Initiatives Hackathon. This was organized um, to allow us to understand what we needed to do in a pandemic climate to enable us to reach our audiences, but also to create things that suited the purpose of either creating fashion for a pandemic or for being able to reach an audience that is hampered by the pandemic, i.e. they can't just jump on a plane and go to Shanghai Fashion Week or New York Fashion Week, etc. Fashion Week was just a small part of what it is that we did, but I worked with a group as part of the hackathon to focus on highlighting Fashion Week as a platform to do much more. But across the board on the hackathon, some of the things that we talked about was everything from model avatars and templating systems to looking at just two global Fashion Weeks per year, supporting the economy in the fashion industry, and digitizing the future. A lot of these ideas were completely out there and were received maybe not as positively as one might expect. But actually, we all worked very hard on the premise that we wanted to make a change. And 
one of the things that I took away from the experience, especially, is being able to sit here and talk about this stuff today, but also what I could learn about being around creative people. I call them my own people because you guys that work in the fashion industry are just hive minds of creativity. But sometimes you can be a little bit hampered yourselves by not being able to find the access that you need to creative tools, innovations, platforms and devices. So what can we learn about being around our own people? I think a lot. Um, I think that of the sort of 600 of us that were all part of the hackathon over the course of two days, some of the things that we were able to do was transfer information between one another. And so a little bit like what the Lone Design Club are doing so excellently here by hosting these masterclasses and webinars, we can connect with people as far away as Australia or New York or actually on our doorstep between me and in Aarau and Zurich. Um, what that does is makes the world feel much smaller and that there isn't such a massive stride to make in terms of being able to speak the same language of fashion and being able to create the same stuff in fashion. And that's not the same stuff in terms of, oh, we're all going to follow the same seasonal styles, but the same stuff in terms of, are we using devices to be the spokes platform for us? Are we using coding tools and designs to share that information amongst us? What actually came out of it was really interesting. And, and that was that we figured people would not want to look their best because comfort clothing was the main thing that came out of the hackathon, maybe for me. Um, even though the fabric and the fiber could be traced back and had full garment provenance chaining, blockchain, etc. We still managed to come up with the premise that perhaps the types of things that we would be designing for are actually Zoom meetings like this one now, or being on Microsoft Teams, where if you can only see from the shoulders upwards, you don't really have to think about whatever else it is that you're wearing. Whereas if I go to my office in Bern, I tend to want to really look my best. I want to be seen. I like having spiky white or yellow or pink hair. I really enjoy wearing a different pair of glasses every time. But we're in a time now where everything is made to leisure or we're dressed to Zoom. So couture for a lot of us seems to be on the decline. So why would fashion designers and creators want to create high-end chic? Well, I think the reason is because we have to hang on to this idea that we want to move into um, a direction as to where we were, and that's where we want to be. How things were before the pandemic is how we want to be seen. This feels on a fashion level, the pandemic that we're going through, something that a lot of us want to move away from quickly. And how we're going to move away from that quickly actually is not by designing our way out of this. It's probably by devising our way out of this. So being more diligent in terms of the innovative choices we make maybe is more important than what we're actually designing. We're in an arena experience now, right now, where myself and 15 to 20 of us are all in this room. One of the interesting things here is that early on, game developers, especially, and people involved in esports realized that captive audiences are audiences are, who are focused on one particular thing over a period of time. How we sell to those audiences, we can learn from the esports world. They have a captive audience, as you can see in the bottom left hand corner of this screen, which is a bunch of uh, people watching the same game experience in an arena. Now, there might be 20,000 people in this arena, but everything from the can of drink that you're drinking to what people are wearing is fiercely protected. It's been designed and it's been developed by 
people who are geared towards holding on to captive audiences, marketing to them and fully understanding them. And that's what I want you to do today with Rethinking Fashion. Think about how you understand your audience and how you're going to appeal to them. PUBG is um, a game which is quite fun on the mobile. It's player unknown battlegrounds mobile. And on the right hand side of that advertisement there in the top right hand corner is a singer from Japan called Gact. Now Gact is known for wearing very high couture, yet here he is playing a shooter and everybody is buying it. So should we be transcending genre in order to be able to reach our audience fully? Should we be doing away with the traditional sense of how we are reaching our audiences? Should we be using core celeb in different ways? That's something else that I want us to be able to explore today. In a world where avatars are the new supers, we look at people like Krista Turlington, Cindy Crawford, and we reminisce, Naomi Campbell, because now we've got Bella Hadid and we've got uh, uh, Lil Miquela, and she is a, an avatar. She is not real. She's an influencer that has been created in a computer. Bella is a real person. Bella is a supermodel like Cindy Crawford, like Naomi Campbell before her, like Linda Evangelista. All of these supers exist on a catwalk. They are clothes horses. They do things for us. They give us inspiration and aspiration in places where we feel like that could be the best version of ourselves. So actually, these days, characters, I'm calling them characters because that's effectively what they are, like Amaya Rush, Angela Nicuela, these girls represent something that is totally different to an audience that we are not prepared for. And the reason why we're not prepared for it is because we don't think like influencers and we don't think like gamers. We think like designers and we think like retail spenders and users. And that's perhaps where our thinking needs to change a little bit on the avatar side, because avatars really are the new supers. Christy Turlington and I don't wake up for less than 10,000 a day is what Linda Evangelista said in around 1991. What used to be easy in 1995 of putting a supermodel onto a catwalk is now replaced by the traditional avatar, which you might see on the left hand side of the screen, which could be in a PlayStation or in an Xbox or some other um, video game or virtual experience. What we can see on the right hand side of the screen here is from a company called Beware who are based in Zurich. These guys are building avatars out of our bodies. So we are able to um, envision ourselves through ourselves, through our own eyes, the way that we look into a mirror. And then what happens is Marina and her team, she is watching the Zoom today, put together patterns that are based on your actual fit. So fit has never been more important as it is right now. And fit is important because we are not masculine bodies. We're not short, we're not round apples, we're not pear shaped, we're all those things. And without using technology to be able to identify exactly who we are, we can't really get a good enough picture of our fashion self. And the comment that I make from Linda Evangelista about not getting up for less than 10,000 a day, these days for avatar development in uh, technical applications or virtual reality means that it's probably not going to cost 10,000 a day to create an avatar anymore. And once those avatars are created, those avatars belong to you. Whatever you create, either through Meeple or through Body G and even Beware, you can now experience and explore in a variety of different e-commerce spaces. Even avatars in the traditional sense that you can see on the left hand side of the screen are useless in the world of fit. I wanted to look at how many startups have appeared over the course of the last eight to 12 months since the pre-pandemic phase and to where we are now. And this is where Fashion Week gets much easier 
for guys and girls like yourselves who are interested in creating beyond the traditional. So taking the red carpet and actually being the red carpet, making the red carpet, placing the red carpet in a variety of different places and making your own scene. I think that's what's most important. In week one, I looked at actually using different spaces and different parts of the digital landscape to really own your fashion, own your creations, own your design. And what I'm saying to you now is that there are a whole host of different places that you can go to on the internet and as a downloadable where you can start to build your entire supply chain, whether that's looking at design with Clo and uh, Stitch, etc., or whether that's looking at digitization services for mass production through companies like um, Pixelcore or um, Digit. And then finally, on the right hand side of the screen, you can see the AR retail commerce, wannabe, and then the game styling apps, covet, dressed and attire. Everything in the middle from jaw to um, DNA block and our friends at Beware and Tuckertech and um, the guys over at Meeple. Um, these guys are really revolutionizing how the human form can be placed in a variety of different places without having to fake it. And that's what's super important. It's bespoke, it drives change, and it requires a strong tech stack. So if you're thinking about creating a micro studio that is fully tech ready, then please start to think about a good tech stack where you can follow an entire PLM through the technology, not through the physical. And put your front row in focus. I talked about these guys a lot, but Avic in Life are incredible because they, since 2009, have been doing front rows. They have been doing fashion weeks on a regular basis and it allows their end users to be super creative. They can buy their own clothes, they can modify their own clothes. So it makes the end user or the player, the designer. And what's wonderful about this is that Avakin Life is an entire world. So if you don't want to go to a front row and you don't want to spend time at the Avakin Fashion Week or be involved in the fashion issue, you just go back to your apartment or down to the beach or go and have drinks with your friends. But what is great about African life is that it's a wholly social experience. So unless you're prepared to be a part of that movement, then, and I guess this is an opinion from me personally, your experience in the fashion self and your micro studio or your um, uh, wholesale or catwalk experience is going to be quite limited because Without people, you're not really going to be able to put your ideas and creativity out there. It's a two way street. One of the first things we learn in design is about reward and response. What you put out there, you have to get back. So if you're thinking about starting something that is completely new and you want to be totally fresh, I would advise that you spend a little bit of time in advocating life to fully understand what your creations might become and who you might be. But what questions should or do creators ask? In everything that we make, myself included in technology solutions and in game development, I always ask about the realism and whether the audience needs it and will it get an audience long term and is the production viable? Production viability often revolves around budgetary constraints, but also in this phase where we're digitizing everything, it revolves massively around digitization and tech stack. If a production that you have in your head is huge, like Helsinki Fashion Week, which we'll come to in a few moments, then you have to be prepared for a tech stack that can maintain that level of usability. So the more people that you place into an experience like Helsinki Fashion Week, the more you have to be able to support those people on that platform. It's a little bit for me, like making an esports game. We work in things called instances. So we allow 10 to 100 people 
to experience one part at a time. But it's not a first come first serve basis, it all happens at the same time. And the reason why it all happens at the same time is because you have a stable enough technology solution to be able to maintain that amount of people all working, visiting, fighting, um, chatting, doing anything social or sociable all at the same time. It's something for you to consider if you are thinking about growing something into a fashion week. Fashion weeks really work when there are lots of people there. A closed fashion week is no fun for anybody, but a fashion week that's not supported by technology is not going to be a great fashion week. So if you're still unsure about how the viability of such an idea could come to fruition, at the end, you can ask questions or I'm always there to be able to connect with or reach out to. This is one of my favorite designers, Angel Chen. And one of the reasons why I absolutely adore everything that she does is that she thinks about innovation first. She thinks about the end user, not as you know, a 47 year old woman like me. She thinks about the end user as what they own, as in, do they have an iPad? Have they got a phone? Are they using a computer? Did they ever watch Akira? So the types of influences that Angel has particularly come from her homeland, obviously, but also from the world around her in terms of innovation, design um, and culture. And culture is a very important part of design and development. And it certainly is an important part of design and development when we're talking about innovation of things and technology. So if you want to start quick and you want to hit the ground running, why not think about collaborating? Angel Chen does this well. She last year did a fantastic experience, a collaborative experience with H&M, um, which resulted in affordable uh, clothing um, under her brand, which reached a wider audience than she would probably have reached if she was following just the pure couture rules. And who's in? So who can you bring to your collection to get people excited about what it is that you're doing. I always listen to my boss on this and he is pretty great at judo flipping. Judo flipping basically means that what you or anybody else think is normal, switch it on its head and try something that's completely abnormal. And that always makes people think. So if you want to build up a nice little press pack, don't think about following traditional media, maybe talk to people in League of Legends or Avakin Live. Put your press releases out into the games industry or put your press releases out into a specific industry that best suits where your technology sits. Are you creating something virtual, digital, or physical? These are all really important because if it's physical, you need time. It has to go through the supply chain and it has to be ready unless you're doing print on demand or development on demand clothing. This is still a massive growth area, but wish.com naturally um, are the sort of leaders in this field currently where they are experiencing and experimenting with print on demand as a mass media product. So if you see something that you really like, then fast fashion is the direction for this current trend. As soon as it calms down, however, we will probably look at the opportunity of using fast fashion to drive design rather than to, to drive development and supply chain. Also, this virtual or digital. Um, virtual or digital is quite interesting because, again, uh, if you want to be um, successful, you don't have to be successful in the physical. You don't have to do collaborations with H&M. You can do collaborations like Louis Vuitton did with Riot Games. You can do collaborations like Jeremy Scott does with licensing brands from Tetris to Transformers. And then costings versus time to profit. How much is it going to cost to build a collection in the physical? Very expensive. How much will it cost to try it out in the digital first? It's going to be very cheap. So if you want to do test collections, for example, you want to build up good focus groups, my advice is to go digital first or virtual first. Feel what the water is like when you dip your toe into it. And if you still feel that physical is the way forward, 
then why not do a hybrid of the two? Why not make some of your items digital or virtual and some of them available to buy as physical entities? It is something that Louis Vuitton are looking into. Profiling your line. I like to create uh, player profiles when I make video games or I do technical applications. Here are a selection of, on a game that I'm working on at the moment, here are a selection of player profiles. We have a very specific end user in mind and they come from one of these four representations of uh, spending um, and human condition. So the reason why we build these player, player profiles particularly is because we want to appeal to them as end users. To do that, if we're making a video game, we need them to spend money. So to spend money, we have to understand what the psychology of how they spend money is. It's not as easy as going through the PLM or the, or the PMF um, in terms of uh, data analytics from, say, EPOS or sales or some other kind of auditing program. It's about humanity, and that sounds probably very worthy, but actually the psychology of how we put these things together is very simple. When we create games, we look at games that are already successful, and then we build the player profile out of those games. So the types of programs that you could use could be things like App Annie. So you can find App Annie on the internet. And App Annie is really fantastic in the games industry because every single game that's ever been made, there are details about how many downloads there were, the, the sort of average target sales audience, how much the average spend is, all that kind of great information. I'm always very curious as to why these things don't transfer well into other areas when actually all our family is doing is the same as product market fit auditing, which is what happens in the, on the fashion side as part of PLM oftentimes. So the same data is being taken out of the same pool, it's being repositioned or readdressed for specific use cases. And that's all player profiling is. So if you're building a line and it's a specific style why not try, just for a change, to do something that's more tech facing in terms of building the perfect target sales audience? And you can do that by going over to App Annie, or you can reach out to me and I'll happily send the slide presentation over for you, which you can use as a template. A reminder about what we did in the first week. I talked about a bunch of different platforms that you can use to try out your collections, try out your designs, try out your lines, think about who your players are, maybe connect with them. There are lots of different places and spaces that you can do this. So just a quick recap. Altspace is a VR and web platform that is solely based on the physical, digital, social life. So you can have meetings in there, you can have one-to-ones in there, you can do a variety of different things in art space. In fact, it wasn't so long ago that there were a great bunch of fashion week talks in art space, which was very successful because everybody, like with this Zoom conference now, are all just watching one person deliver on a screen. Only the person that was delivering was a digital avatar rather than this pretty face. And this Avic in Life that I spoke about before, Unity Mars is a tool which combines the Unity platform uh, for tablets and mobile phones with AR. So you can build AR in this program. MRKT, short for um, MRKit, is a Microsoft and Unity collaboration tool, which again focuses on mixed reality. So that's HoloLens or glasses technology. ARKit and LiDAR is an Apple supported community. Uh, the LiDAR is a scanner. ARKit is the program. And the AR program is a little bit like what I've mentioned before Unity Mars, MRKit. It's a platform for being able to put your LiDAR scans 
into an environment that everyone can see. Eighth Wall is a company that's based in the US that build experiences for you. You can either do it on the basis of providing them with the objects that you want to make, or you can choose something off the shelf and they can make that for you very quickly. AR Core is the Google AR platform. Um, you can look at everything from natural history to playing football in that experience. And then finally, Oculus ISV is the business program that supports the current Oculus Quest and Quest 2. These um, are possibly the closest that we have at the moment to the most successful lifestyle virtual reality experiences. So that's Quest and Quest 2. And the reason for that is because Facebook has a very, Facebook owns Oculus, Facebook has a very open sourced approach to having people create for this world. So whether you want to create a furniture program um, where you can place furniture inside a, an apartment or your own room, or whether you want to hold conferences in the Oculus, or whether you want to do your fashion week in Oculus, you can do that. Any of the things that you can do in the physical, you can do in the Quest. Everything about extended reality boils down to the following three things. And the fourth thing, which is action. Awareness, interest and desire. Being an evangelist about fashion is one thing. But being an evangelist about the technology that you're supporting your fashion with is another thing entirely. And that's super important because if you recall last week, we had a really interesting question about changing the hearts and minds of how uh, luxury houses and fashion houses and non-luxury houses approach fashion development. It's very old fashioned. There are lots of average ages of sort of 50 to 70 year olds where there's not a great deal of digital maturity and so therefore there's not a great deal of digital or virtual uptake. So awareness, and I find this quite a lot in my job, oftentimes I have to sell the aspirational approach, inspire the desire for people to want to use virtual reality and not traditional pen and paper. Then interest. If you've built a good player profile or a collection profile system for your end user and your focus group, this should be really simple for you to be able to connect with the interest. But remember what I said about doing the judo flip, thinking about things in a different way from a different capacity. And then finally, desire. Make every garment in the virtual or the digital the best version, better than you could ever possibly imagine in the physical. And people will literally fall over themselves to buy it. I guess if you were at my talk last week, you would have seen, uh, or actually two weeks before, you would have seen the Louis Vuitton handbag and the drill down that we did on the Louis Vuitton sample. Well, of course, Louis Vuitton is a brand name. People want that in their life. But actually, what I really wanted out of the Louis Vuitton was the textile, the material. I wanted to get down further. I wanted to see what the world was like from down there, five microns in. And it looks amazing in there. And it allows me to be able to bring people over from a desirability perspective to say, hey, this is what we can do with textile and garment provenance. We can work out what's real from what's fake. And then finally, action. Once you put yourself out there and say, I am making a virtual collection, you're making a virtual collection. Once you put yourself out there and say that you're going to do a digital catwalk, You've got to do that digital catwalk. And everything that we create in digital and technology has to be about this. Action is where innovation comes from. So this is um, a little bit of uh, a video of uh, in the background that you might be able to enjoy of the Helsinki Fashion Week. This is um, Embassy. Evelyn Mora is a, quite a leader in this field and she put together um, the Helsinki Fashion Week, but it was done in a digital village style. 
So there are lots of different places that you could go to within the digital village to be able to access couture and access design. But remember that all of it was 100% digital. There was no physical in there unless you actually wanted to have the uh, real life garments themselves. And then you have the opportunity to reach out to the, di the designer. So if you're part of a community or you want to collaborate, there are lots of opportunities for you to be able to do that, either through Housing for Fashion Week or actually start to create some stuff yourself. I have been approached this week by um, the Miami and Brooklyn Fashion Weeks. Those guys want to go completely 100% online. And to do that, they need to do an incredible amount of design rethinking. They've got to think about the time to market. How long do they want to wait between creating garments? It's obviously going to take a little bit longer if you're doing it for the first time, to actually meeting and understanding the needs of the end user and consumer and of course the end user and consumer on the front row those guys and girls are really really going to want to talk to you know more about you how will you communicate with them the quality of the objects has to be high but there's no point sort of going into any style of digital fashion week sort of half cocked because i think that if you don't go full in um, this obviously affects the creative self as well and your ability to be able to develop collections that you're not happy with makes a designer or creator an unhappy designer or creator and then finally the footprint of the transactables everything that you see in the digital village show here is 100 percent digital it can be reused from these beautiful flowers all the way to the landscapes to this grey box mentality that we talked about in the first week um, of being able to limit the end user and the creator to a space where they can fully be themselves. Um, but I think you have to think about reusing these experiences Otherwise, what tends to happen is this stuff can be quite costly, and that's not cool either. So let's try and make life real again. We talked a lot about digital, and now let's kind of judo flip and talk about the real. These days, you can do stuff. You can get your avatar in Fortnite to wear things that you probably never thought about doing before or in second life you can hire your own designer to make your own clothes for you but your avatar can buy and wear gucci currently in some programs but they can't wear that gucci in real life and that's a real shame i want to be able to change the way that we think about that a little bit and um, although i know that gucci especially i'm picking on, on those guys are everywhere at the moment um, as are Dior and um, Balenciaga, etc. Um, I would like to be able to see that there is a, a kind of dual conversation that happens between the digital and the virtual and what we do in real life. That's not wasteful, but it really does have a zero waste innovation connected to it. So trying to be digital for as long as it's humanly possible before going physical is the way forward. And, you know, in games like Aglet, um, Gucci have just done a collaboration with those uh, people. But these shoes don't exist in real life. They've been created just for the game. So we have to also be aware that the things that we're going to covet or the things that we really want to see or that, you know, are somehow going to make our lives better like they do in the physical when we see a fantastic pair of shoes might not actually ever make it to the shelves of um, Oxford Street or Bahnhofstrasse or, you know, Saks Fifth Avenue or whatever. We might never see those things because they're not real. They have been created for promotional purposes only. Why can't we see them in real life? I talked about these guys earlier and Louis Vuitton and League of Legends came together to, to uh, allow their players in League of Legends to wear something called skin. And a skin is oftentimes a non-competitive augmentation 
a viper a screen, something that's nice to look at, or something that makes your character or avatar look amazing while they're in the game. A lot of people cut their teeth in the digital world, um, excuse the phrase, by uh, being skin makers. And that is creating something under their own brand that other people buy as a virtual good. You will find over the next five years that this style of branding, positioning, development and marketing is going to skyrocket. So if you want to get in on the ground floor of creating virtual goods that could be real, if they come from your personal collection or your studio collection, or that will never be real, and that you really are just trying to find your way through the digital labyrinth, skin making or virtual goods development is a really good place to start. And then when we go back to the physical, as part of the League of Legends um, uh, uh, season that, that those guys did together as a collaboration, we can see what came out of it. Here we've got a t-shirt that costs $600 that could be bought from Louis Vuitton featuring a character in League of Legends called Kiana. And she is actually decked in the game in full Louis Vuitton monogram clothing. So it's interesting how these two things switch between the physical and the in-game life. So what we see in the in-game life, we really want to put a stamp on and say, this is us. But in real life, we're actually wearing nothing like what we would be wearing inside the game. So it's a different, entirely different aspirational version of ourselves. But it certainly works for Virgil Abloh's and that's why I think that uh, Virgil Abloh has done such an amazing job at Louis Vuitton to really transform, especially male couture, into something that is believable, usable, and more importantly, reusable. So in taking game life from the digital and bringing it into the physical, we can see that there is a sense of um, growth in this area that physical isn't dead and that we do not need to design uh, sweatpants. We do not need to create items of clothing that literally appeal to our Zoom self and that we can have these fashion aspirations and we can grow in terms of what it is that we see ourselves being, not just today, but five years from now. Because although our Louis Vuitton bag or our Gucci bag or our shoes have value now, and they have value five years from now, actually us as avatars have a great deal more value in terms of how you guys listening today will be dressing us and developing us in the future. So the producer is dead. Long live the producer. We're all creating content now and you guys are no different. You're the original content creators. And now we as the end users are telling you what we want to see. So from this Gucci representation, um, which is completely and utterly uh, CGI developed and uh, 3D augmented, it can be used as a virtual good or a skin. This dress potentially is not real. It's still worth $10,000 is still completely purchasable. And as a producer, the value that you place on your garments should be as important as the value that you place on your end user. So what you create, what you do, who you serve, really depends on how far down the innovative rabbit hole you want to go. And always I would say, remember that there are people around you who are uber experienced, some people that are on that experience but have great ideas and that we're all prepared to come on this journey with you because we are the music makers and we're the dreamers of dreams. We're the producers, you're the producers and, and we can do it together. As usual, you can find our demo on Google Play or in the App Store. We are so real, we look after real world objects in a digital space for fashion, games, film and museums. Our objects are of high quality and have ease of use and our entire studio is made up of a million experts like you.
So if you ever have any questions, don't hesitate. I have thoroughly enjoyed presenting for the Learn Design Club Accelerator. And this it has been a real eye opener, I know, for a lot of you. And I hope that we can all carry on the journey together. If you have any questions, I am here to answer them for you. Thank you so much, Amanda, back to you. Great, thank you so much, Kelly. Um, another fantastic presentation again. So thank you, yes, round of applause, everyone. Um, if you do have any questions, um, then please ask away now. Feel free to turn on your camera, introduce yourself, tell us a bit about you. Um, or if you don't want to do that, then you can just drop it in the chat box and I'll be able to read out your question for you. In the meantime, um, if anyone has any questions about what's happened in the past, um, this is our fourth webinar. So there are three previous to this one um, and you can find all of those over on YouTube as well as this one if you missed any parts that you want to go over again. Um, but yeah, anyone have any questions to start with? No worries. Um, please, fine. Gotta go. We're here via email at all times. Um, I mean, I can go if no one wants. Um, yeah. So thank you, Kelly, very much for your lovely talk. Um, I have a question. So um, how do you imagine like the future, how a shopping experience will look like? Is it that you, because you, you, you showed a lot of like uh, wipes and I was wondering if it's like a platform you're imagining where designers are kind of creating crazy stuff themselves and are enabled to, to, to design um, things and don't have to run through a lot of like big huge companies and um, seasons where which get post produced um, a year in advance and these kind of things. So do you imagine a, a faster pace and more freedom to design or what, what do you have in mind as a vision? I think I imagine, thanks for your question, Brenna. I think that I imagine um, uh, a fast design process. So fast fashion should live in the design process. We should be rapid prototypers and we should be able to iterate quickly based on what we feel and understand is the best form of uh, product for the end user. And to answer your question about devices and do I see everything being device or platform driven, I do. I see us being part of either a wider village experience or a little bit more maybe like the African life or second life or can ever experience where there is a world that you can go to, a little bit like alt space VR right now, but unfortunately alt space VR is not very visually stunning and exciting, whereas Avakin Life like actually is. So it is a place that you should really aspire to want to be rather than feel like you have to go there because someone's showing their collection there. Um, so it has to be a place where people feel that they're comfortable and not just an e-commerce experience. Hmm. But maybe a follow up question on that. So do you um, think that the kind of gaming culture or the, the again, the, the virtual um, culture is moving closer together with also the real physical world in that sense? Yeah, in the last quarter, in the last two quarters of the pandemic, I think um, people spent over 10.1 billion dollars on in-game purchases so if you can allow yourself to think about what that would mean to the profitability of your creations you have to find yourself in a place where you can cover both of those areas so not 100 turning your development into a game but maybe taking something out of the playbook of these game developers and why they're so successful and understanding the ways that you can reach out to your player as either a profile or an end user or a consumer. Um, you could learn quite a lot from the games industry. 
Thank you. I, I have a question as well. I'm in the US right now, so far away. <laughs> um, I hope you're having a great day. I'm so sorry. Yeah. It's still going on, so it's <laughs> not almost over, but oh well. But um, so I recently got into the fashion industry. I don't really have a lot of um, knowledge in it, but I kind of got into it because of like the whole sustainability thing. And I'm like learning about the fact that it's just so bad for the world. And like at first I was kind of looking at, you know, how we can use better fabrics and stuff. And I kind of landed on the digital area. And when I landed on that, I like I found some companies that are doing completely digital fashion. They're like doing um like, it where they'll style you in the outfit that you buy and you can like post it to your Instagram and stuff. And I thought that was super cool. And I just wanted to know what you thought about that field. Absolutely love it. We talked about sustainability um, in the supply chain a couple of weeks ago. And one of the reasons why I, I'm with you, I feel that it's so important is that we have to have this um, zero waste innovation psyche as developers. We can't be thinking um, as creators of the physical the whole time. We have to apply the digital. That's why there are companies like, um, I, I think, um, uh, Material Exchange and, and Texture Call and Adobe Substance. And a lot of these companies are really amazing at using texture to drive the uh, DNA, if you like, of the garment that you want to create. So if you have a particular way of designing and you want to be able to try out the fabric and the quality first, then there are programs now that are available to you to have a look. We talked about this actually before everybody came online. Um, that if you can access the fabric and the textile itself to see how it moves before you use it. And that's really important because if we all move the same and everything looks the same, then there is no desire to purchase these garments or this couture. And so then there's no point to us being creators in this field. So we have to be constantly looking at ways, Shade, that we can innovate on what it is that we want our end product to be. So being satisfied with just one type of textile or one style of garment, that's not going to be enough to really satisfy our sustainability needs either. Um, so using these types of programs like Clo um, or talking to guys like Stylacoot, who are based out of Paris, France, these guys are also from the games industry and they create avatars that sachet so they move the fabric for you and that's really valuable to where we're going in product development yeah i definitely agree with that like i talked to the founder of this company called republic and they're like a 3d digital fashion and they're working on like kind of the whole texture thing too as well so yeah, that's cool so if you can bring a, a lot of that stuff into your studies there are a million different ways of you being able to understand garment provenance. We did a, a whole um, episode on it a couple of weeks ago, which you can get off, off of YouTube. Um, just connect with Amanda and uh, she'll, she'll point you in the general direction, but it's on uh, the Lone Design Club YouTube. And there's a lot of information in there that you can take away also if it's uh, integral to your studies. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, definitely check out those videos. Um, hi, we've got another question, Giovanni. Yeah, uh, thank you for amazing uh, trainings and actually demos about the technology. It's, I think it's very important. But I'm concerned about, I'm from New York, uh, by the way, <laughs> and I work for the Fashion Institute of Technology, FIT. So my, my concern is, I know the technology is amazing around and, and all these demos about how the avatar move with the clothes that you create. And my concern is if your product is gonna be uh, showing and these amazing things, but 
is how do people gonna buy even when they don't know they're gonna fit properly and uh, all the texture or the garment gonna be great in your body, no? Um, I know the biggest sellers is, and with this pandemic, it was online. It was amazing for the big companies, but at the same time, um, I think we need the stores. We need something to show the real garment, no? Um, I know to promote your products and all, uh, and these kind of things is amazing. But my concern is, what happened if I bought something like that and I don't like it? I have to return. Good question. 80% of, uh, of clothing that is purchased is returned. And that is no good for fashion waste. That is a massive problem in terms of landfill, etc. But I hope that in today's session, particularly when we looked at digital avatars earlier on, you're able to see that companies like Beware, Meeple, Body G, these, these uh, companies are kind of directing their entire offering based on the dimensions of the human body and not of the international sizing methods. Because the international sizing methods, I've had quite a lot of debates about this over the years and, uh, you know, really mannequins haven't changed since around the 1890s to 19, early 1900s. So because mannequins haven't really changed a great deal, it means that our aspirational body shapes haven't changed a great deal either. But actually our bodies have changed massively. And so without being able to use this fit technology, then we will always be buying clothes that don't fit. So fortunately, we now do have fit technologists like those guys that I've mentioned before. There are millions of other avatar developers. The avatar itself is not enough. The fit has to be the driver um, and the reasons why companies like Jaw can create these virtual wardrobes, these virtual catwalks. I said in the first week that I carry my dimensions around on an Excel spreadsheet. I still do. I have done for many, many years. But now I don't have to do that because I can just LIDAR scan my entire body. And yes, I mean, it's the same for footwear. Um, virtual try-ons are not enough anymore. They just tell us what a shoe looks like on potentially, but it doesn't tell us what a shoe fits like. And we've been working with a company based in Israel to ensure also that fit technology for feet is enabled because nobody else is doing this in the, in the fashion business. Nobody else is creating footwear technology that fits. If we're on our feet for nine hours a day and no shoes are going to give us blisters and rub up, who is taking care of our feet? It's not some of the luxury houses, they don't care. It's not some of the sportswear apparel companies because they don't have the time to be able to do that with the amount of information, metadata and design that they have to push out there. So it relies upon fit technologies to be able to make that for us. So watch this space on the footwear side, especially we're working in this part of the industry, but on the clothing fit side of the business, you know, there are some people that are in this chat tonight on the Zoom who actually are driving this technology for us. So reach out to Beware, reach out to Meeple and Body G and, and those guys. There are a variety of other people that are doing this, but we can't be in a position where we can just accept that 80% of returns is okay from uh, e-commerce sales because there are companies that are teetering on the edge of bankruptcy because of the amount they're spending on returns and that affects the economy massively. Great, thank you for that question. Um, anyone else got any questions or anything that they'd like to add? It's fine if you don't. Um, if you do have anything that kind of pops up afterwards, um, then be sure to get in touch with myself, Kelly. Um, and you're feeling generous, give us both a good follow on Instagram. Um, and then we can engage and share for as long as we want. Um, but if no one else has any other questions, then Kelly, thank you so much.
I'm super, super interested again. And it's very sad that this is our last um, episode in partnership. Um, hopefully we'll be doing things in the future as well. Who knows, maybe next fashion week we can uh, do something in collaboration, um, be ahead of the curve, something very digital there. Um, so yeah, everyone else, thank you so much for joining us. If you did miss out, then head over to YouTube or email us for any further information. Thank, thank you so much for your time, everybody. Stay in touch with us and we'll see you again soon. Thanks, bye. Bye. Thank you, bye.